This morning we were praying about what God's doing in the like people who are young right now as they've been going through a lot of craziness, you know, and like the, the all the all the tension around the election and um, the pandemic and quarantining and all the race riots and the pain in our country on racism. And um, it'd be easy to start thinking that like, oh man, they're gonna be so traumatized. And you know, a lot of them probably are and they need inner healing and they need you to love them and stuff. But also, what if right now God has the youth out in the field slaying the lion and the bear? What if that's what they're going through right now? What if they're being trained and groomed through this hard, through the hard 2020 to slay Goliath? Who, like, who wants to believe for that? Why don't we believe that? That, <laughs> that greater is he who's in our kids than the events that are in the world, <laughs> right? Like there's children being risen up right now with um, like Martin Luther King Jr. is being raised up right now to bring transformation to broken parts of our society around discrimination. Um, ones that are being raised up right now to, to reverse legislation that, that harms women and takes uh, li the lives of babies, you know? What if like that is what God is doing right now? Come on. All right, so my dad mentioned this. My name's Wilson, by the way. If I don't know you, it's probably because um, I haven't met you yet, no. It's really deep. If I don't know you, welcome. So glad to see you here. And on the live stream, peeps, what's up? Sorry that I'm not seeing you, but like I always say, it's really great that you get to see me. That's a joke. I'm nothing great to see. All right, so we're having Robbie Dawkins in a couple weeks, February 20th and 21st. Who's excited for that? Come on. Now, who wants to get more excited for that? Will you throw the picture up, Anthony? You know, last week we were praying for Robbie because he was being detained in a country and we figured out why he was being detained. <laughs> this is Robbie on the streets of Afghanistan. Okay? <laughs> so that's pretty tight. Who wants to tap more into what Robbie has tapped into? <laughs> you know, Robbie has tapped into the truth that he's a new creation that his home is not earth, that he has an eternal home in the heavens, like literally willing to die. I mean, this is the type of thing where you go get, you just, someone walks out and shoots you right now. And literally the missionaries that Robbie's working with have friends who went into a part of Afghanistan or a part of the city they were living in with sandwiches, to hand out sandwiches to people. But these guys were known missionaries. Someone walked down to the street, a police officer, an Afghan police officer walked down the street, shot him in the head and killed him, a missionary. So I mean like, Robbie walking around like this, he knows the potential of what's about to happen, okay? And so I just say mark it down in your calendar, February 20th, 21st. Um, this is why we are having Robbie come. So that we can all live in more of who we really are and what Robbie brings and what Robbie represents. So bring, bring friends and stuff. Um, it's gonna be really good. All right, so this morning we're starting a series called Salt of the Earth. And we're gonna be in this series at least until Robbie comes, maybe a couple weeks after that as well. And you know, Salt of the Earth is a famous statement Jesus made in the Sermon on the Mount. And um, what the series though is really about, what we're really gonna be talking about is the judgment of God. So um, if anyone wants to just you know, mark these, calend these weeks, weeks not to come, go ahead, just pull your phone out. Remind, no, I'm just kidding. It's gonna be really good. I'm so excited to talk about the judgment of God and for us to kind of press into what is, the, what is the gospel, what does the new covenant teach us about the judgment of God? What does that look like in our life, in the lives of people around us? How does it, how does it show itself in the world and in unbelievers' lives? Um, this is gonna be really good. Uh, buckle up, baby. So before I dive into that, well, let me say this really quick. The devil has really deceived and hijacked the message of God's judgment. He has really twisted it and um, through bad teaching and through lack of understanding about what the discipline of God is and the judgment of God, um, he has made us like fearful of that idea. When in reality in Hebrews 12, it talks about the discipline of the Lord, which spoiler alert, I'm gonna talk about this later, but God judges that you need discipline and then he begins to discipline you 
or he or circumstances around you start to discipline you. And it says that he does that for our good. That means that out of a good place in his heart, he says, hey, I'm not angry, but I can't let this thing that's gonna destroy you continue to build in your life, so I'm gonna judge you. I, I judge that you need discipline. All right, so um, let me just pray for us really quick, okay? Lord, I just pray for grace for our ears to hear truth. Give us discernment and soft hearts. I just rebuke you, accuser and fear-mongering devil that wants to confuse us and uh, trick us and make us feel insecurity and all that. I just break that and I wipe that off with the people in this room who are experiencing that right now. I used to be you. I would be scared of the judgment of God. But Lord, thank you that there's actually so much hope and um, goodness in your when you judge that we need discipline. So I just pray grace for us to hear it, Lord. And anything I say that's whack or not right or not on point, Lord, just um, correct me and let it not fall on their ears, but let it fall on my dad's ears and Luke's ears so they can teach me and correct me. In Jesus' name, <laughs> amen. All right, so before I dive into salt of the earth, I wanna read you a text really quick. This is really cool testimony um, that just happened about a month ago. Some friends of mine, people who come to this church, Matt and Betsy, they're first service folk. So they're gone by now when you 1130 folk are here. But uh, listen to this amazing testimony that is for all of us, okay? So Betsy's, this is about Betsy's dad. My dad threw his back out and couldn't walk. He's, you know, like late 60s, maybe 70s, something like that. So he's not like an old, old guy. My dad threw his back out and couldn't walk. We prayed for him with the kids. He wasn't healed after the first prayer, so we prayed again. I, Betsy, saw Lucy, which is her like eight-year-old daughter, have a physical reaction when we started praying. So like they start praying, and as they're praying, Lucy's like, does something, I don't know what, but had some kind of reaction. So we asked her if she saw something from the Lord. She said she saw two bones come back together. As soon as she said it, my dad's back was healed, and it's been fine ever since. Come on. So just when she said it, isn't that sweet? That's power. Something happened. Come on, Lucy. Um, okay, now, one week later, he was scheduled to have an angiogram and a stint for some kind of other heart procedure. He had multiple tests that confirmed he had blocked arteries and even a dead portion of his heart where he had a silent heart attack. Again, we prayed for him along with a lot of other people. But that night, we gathered and prayed for him. And Lucy saw the Lord has given my dad a new heart as we were praying. Emmy, their older daughter, who's 11, saw the hospital room and said all the doctors and nurses looked astounded. The next day, after we went in for the test, we got a phone call from my dad. They had finished the angiogram, and there was no need for surgery because my dad's heart was completely and totally perfect. A new heart, a new heart. My dad's best friend is his doctor, and it's our Uncle Barry. He confirmed that this was indeed a medical miracle. Jesus is king, and he healed my dad. All right, so now I wanna ask, well, first of all, let's just give a little more glory to Jesus for that. Lord, thank you. Jesus, thank you so much. We honor you. You're so kind and good. Thank you for your healing, God. And I pray right now for people in the room who are um, battling congenital heart disease, be healed in Jesus' name. People who have dead spots, if that's you, just put your hand on your heart. Dead spots, be well in Jesus' name. I, I just feel like God's fire is coming into people's chests right now. So I release the fire of God to come into your chest as you need it. He's also doing lungs and other organs. So Lord, healing, I just release your healing power in this room. Thank you that when we read this testimony, you're just rearing, chomping to the bit, saying, I wanna do it again, just release it to happen. So we release healing for hearts and backs in this room right now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so believe it or not, but that was actually the judgment of God in Betsy's dad's life. Because the word judgment fundamentally, it, let's, will you pull that slide up, Anthony? Um, it's a Greek word, krema, and what it means is to separate, 
put asunder. Who even knows what asunder means? I feel like I'm in the way old days. To pick out, select, choose, to approve, esteem, to prefer, to be of opinion, deem, think, to be of opinion, to determine, resolve, decree, and then finally we get down to the traditional idea we have of judging, which is pronouncing right or wrong. But look at the top, to separate, to pick out, to select. There's nothing bad about picking out and selecting things. Those are strawberries, those are grapes. <laughs> I judge that you are berry and you are merry. That is, that is judgment, okay? And like God said, you know what? This back is jacked. This heart is really messed up. I am judging this situation right now. And then they prayed and he was healed. That is the judgment of God in his life. And like, honestly, that's a more fundamental definition of the word judgment and how it's used in the Bible than we think of. Because we always, just be honest, I mean, I'm being honest, this is me, I always paint judgment in a negative light. I think of, do not uh, um, pick out the speck in your brother's eye before, without taking out the log in your own eye. And we're like, don't judge, don't judge. But then, you know, the next statement is, the whole point of that is, take good care of yourself so that when you judge people around you, you can actually help them and you're not a hypocrite. <laughs> it's not, don't ever have an opinion about things or don't ever judge, it's, yourself first. And so, like I said earlier, man, God is wanting to take back this idea of judgment from the devil so that we can um, embrace it when it comes into our life. Now, before I get deeper into judgment, um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the Old Covenant and what judgment was like in the Old Covenant versus what judgment looks like in the New Covenant. You know that we're in the New Covenant, meaning that there's a new system, a new relate type of relationship that God is having with the world and the church. Jesus brought a new type of relationship to earth, a new whole system of how the relationship would work. Um, and it's called the new covenant, and it's what we're living in. This is a really important thing to invest um, reading and podcast listening and prayer into. Lord, teach me about the new covenant. <laughs> Help me understand what a covenant is. Like, this is a foundational, I'm not gonna talk about it as much as um, it sounds like I am, but... This is something I just, like your homework, I'd encourage you this year, do some reading. Someone just gave me a dirty look when I said homework. Um, is, I'm just teasing you, is uh, get some books and read about covenant and, and try and understand this. Pray a lot, because there's some stuff out there that's kind of like, but there's some really good teaching out there that help. Okay, let me move on. Um, okay, so salt of the earth. Let's read Matthew 5. Let's build a kind of foundation before we go into judgment. Matthew 5, and we're gonna read 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. All right, I wanna break this down kind of verse by verse. Matthew, let's look at just verse 13 now. And I kind of highlighted parts of it. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, it is no longer good for anything. So in this context, what do you think the point Jesus is trying to make about salt is? What's the purpose of salt in this context? To bring flavor, right? Salt surely has other uses. It can be a preservative and it can do other stuff. But in this context, it's all about does the salt have taste? Does the salt bring taste? What do you usually put salt on? If you're normal, okay, you put salt on something that is bland. Who's not normal and just puts salt and hot sauce on everything? That's me. You could give me like something that has chilies in it and I'd be like, give me the hot sauce. Um, but the intent of salt is to season something. It's to take something that was bland and to give it flavor and to give it taste. And so what Jesus is saying here is that you give the earth flavor. You give people flavor. And it's not like a complimentary type of way because who remembers how bland life was before you knew Jesus? 
right? Like, it sucked. <laughs> Life was bad. We had deceptive um, illusions of happiness and joy and a future, but ultimately, we were in darkness. We had no true hope, and life was horrible before you were in Jesus. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to um, come along those people and say, hey, look at me, and um, we're gonna go into the light section, and you're gonna start to understand who God is, and then your life is gonna have true meaning and flavor. We are the salt of the earth. So you bring flavor, okay? Um, let's go to 14 through 16. This says, I highlighted this part, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Okay, I love the, de the definiteness of that first statement. You are the light of the world. Not try really hard to be the light of the world. Not pray that you may become the light of the world. No, you are the light of the world. And I wanna tell you something. Light has real substance, okay? Light is a real, it's like, it's not, this is not just a metaphor. The Bible speaks over and over in the New Testament about how we are rescued from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. It says in Ephesians that we were darkness, and now we are light. So I just wanna tell you, like, whether you feel like you're light, whether you are shedding light, whether, um, you know, your behavior reflects that you are light is really not the point. The point is that you are light. What Jesus did, and when you put faith in what Jesus did, is greater than what you do from now on. Do you believe that? Do you understand that? It's not about what you do anymore, it's about what you believe. And when you believe right, you will start to do right. When you believe like Jesus, you will start to act like Jesus. And it's scary because you can um, be light, but not act like light. And that's actually where the judgment piece comes in, okay? So we're gonna get there. An example of this, My sister-in-law, you guys saw the girl singing right here this morning. She's, that's my wife's identical twin sister, Jackie. Um, she just left her career as a hairdresser. And she's been cutting hair and going to school. Well, she graduated a while ago and she um, has an amazing job, an amazing salon. She has so much favor there, she's so loved. But through a series of events, she really started to sense the Lord leading her out of working and, and into spending the, the two or three days a week that she was working to being at home with her kids and discipling them and um, being present with them. And she was, and, and just as a really quick kind of like, uh, um, whatever, I don't even know what I'm gonna call it, but I wanna use the right word. As a brief aside, do not, if you're a mom in here, do not hear me describing what Jackie did as the right thing to do. I'm not about to explain why all moms should stay at home and not work. False, I don't believe that, that's not true, that's not God's will for every mother, okay? But in this case, God was leading her to stay home. And what type of, are you guys tracking with me? Okay. And. It was a hard decision for her, it was a sacrifice, but ultimately she felt so much peace and confirmation and support that that's the decision she made. Now, the really cool thing is how her coworkers have responded. Her coworkers who see her like kicking butt, you have it, man, you're, you're a mama and you're working and getting yours like, you know, not just a husband, like I'm sure that's a lot of the mentality because a lot of her, um, like they're amazing sweet people but they just don't necessarily have like a kingdom mindset, they're more worldly in their thinking. Um, they were just like, what? Why are you leaving this awesome career? Like, why are you, sac like, what's the, and you know what she's being in that moment? Salt and light. She is, she is living out and showing by her actions um, kingdom priorities. Someone actually even was here first service who has since gone into the salon 
since Jackie left and texted me, because they heard me say all this, and said, hey, they were talking, that, because they knew that I was an ex-old client of Jackie's, they were talking about her and remarking how impressive it was, and they just still couldn't believe it that she actually left and was now uh, staying at home full-time with her kids. So like, we are light. It's not always something that you say that reveals your light. It's sometimes it's the decisions you make and the things you do. And once again, this is not me trying to convince you guys of what I think the decision mothers should make. Um, so next, let your light shine before others. This was an example of Jackie letting her light shine. This was an opportunity for her to let her light shine and she took it and she shone. Um, there's, but that word let scares me, okay? That word let really is like a reality check for me. Because remember I was saying before that you can be light but not be showing light? <laughs> let your light shine. Let your light shine. You can um, be light but not be revealing light. And it all starts with what you believe and it leads into what, how you act and what you'll become. Um, there's other things that can keep us from letting our light shine, but next, so that they may see your good works. Whose good works will they see? Yours. They're not gonna, it's not, they'll see God's good works. They will see your good works. And then there's this crazy thing where God is faithful and he actually leads, when they see your good works and when you're doing good works on behalf of Jesus, there's like a, basically a promise right here, you guys, that if we do our good works, it will somehow get back to him. It doesn't say, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works, and then you explain to them that it was the Father, and they give glory to your Father who is in heaven. They may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And let's just be real right here. Here's why they're gonna make the connection that your good works attribute glory to your Father in heaven. Because they already know you're a Christian. They already know that you're a believer. <laughs> you have already been acting like a believer and talking about Jesus, not in some annoying way, but in some like, I'm obsessed with my best friend type of way around them. They see, oh, I know that Jackie's a believer because of how she conducts herself and what she talks about and you know how she prayed for me that one time. This crazy decision she made must be because of God. Whoa. That's incredible, like, are you guys tracking with me? So this isn't a license to like be an undercover secret cop Christian, <laughs> you know, like, I'm just gonna let people see my light, but I'm never gonna talk about it. No, we need to proclaim the gospel, we need to share with people, we need to love them out loud, and then when they see our holy life, our kingdom life, it'll give glory to our Father who is in heaven and, and welcome them into relationship with him. So um, bottom line here, we are something, okay? That's what I want you to take away. We are something. But when we don't act like who we are, go back one verse, Anthony, it's actually a pretty stern warning. When we act like, when we don't act like who we are, how, how this, in this parable, in this metaphor, it says that we are useless. You're the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, it is no longer good for anything. That's a hard word, right? If you aren't salty, you're gonna be salty. <laughs> if you don't let your shine, your light shine, you're gonna be real salty, all right? Like, um, you're gonna be ashamed. No, I'm just kidding, but our purpose in life is to worship Jesus and advance his kingdom, period. There are things that fall under those two categories. Like, um, it's not good worship of Jesus to neglect your family and to not love your family and champion them and treasure them. That doesn't worship Jesus at all. That dishonors Jesus. And it's not, so these two priorities, everything can fall under them. Honor Jesus and love God, advance his kingdom. And you know, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So let's just throw them in there too. But the advance of the kingdom includes that. So this is what I'm trying to say. If those aren't your priorities, if you aren't basing your life around those decisions, honoring God and advancing his kingdom, you are like salt that has lost its taste. 
Now, luckily, the, the um, la- salt, its saltiness can't be restored. But raise your hand if you um, are literally anatomically, chemically salt. No one, right? There's probably salt in us. But you are a human. You are a believer. And God can restore your saltiness. When our light gets turned off and when our saltiness factor goes down, that is where we insert the judgment of God. (laughs) The disciplining, the pruning of God to restore our saltiness and to restore our light. Let's keep going. Um, I wanna look at another passage where Jesus actually starts to directly tie in these two concepts of light and judgment. Um, And I'm gonna tell you the context of it, but then I just want you guys, of the passage I'm about to read, but then I just wanna encourage you to, the slides won't be up initially, and I'd encourage you to even maybe close your eyes, don't follow along in your Bible, but just kind of try and listen to the word as it's read over you. So here's the context. Jesus is in Jerusalem at a feast, at a celebration, and he's preaching and teaching, and all of a sudden, the audible voice of God breaks in and affirms who Jesus is and encourages everyone to listen to him, and all the people that are with Jesus, they're, what they say is, was that thunder? No, that was an angel. <laughs> they don't even realize that it's God speaking to them. And Jesus, to turn up the salty factor, all right, he says, that voice, not the salty salt and light factor, but the salty, like, you know, colloquial language factor. Um, Jesus says, that voice didn't even come for me. That voice came for you, and you missed it. God was speaking audibly to these people to help them, and they missed it because of their worldview. So this is what's, this is what's happening. This is the next thing Jesus says, okay? So just close your eyes if you want and just listen in. Let God's kind of word just wash over you here. John 12. So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Jump down to verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Lord, we just want your word to wash over us. We know that your, your word is alive and active, God. It's a privilege that we have to actually read it. We value hearing it too, God. So I just pray that, I, I bless the faith that was released as you just heard the word of God. All right, let's go through this chunk by chunk. Verses 35 and 36. What is the light he is talking about? Well, it's him. <laughs> the light is among you, he's talking about himself. And he says, a little while longer, like it's not gonna be with you. What he's saying is, I'm about to be crucified. I'm not gonna be physically present here with you anymore. I'm gonna die. And this is where it gets really important that we pay attention. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. So first of all, what I was saying before earlier about believe before you become, you know, like believe like God, believe his word, and then you'll start to see it in your life, you'll start to behave like it. That wasn't just like pop culture Wilson thinking. That is Jesus. You believe and then you become. The greatest work you can do in the kingdom of God is to believe like Jesus. Steve Backlund says this, the same way that you enter the kingdom, hearing the word, uh, hearing the word of God by faith, is the same way you advance and mature in the kingdom. It's not like we believe and that's how we get saved and then from then on, we're on our own, baby. It's all about my own works, my flesh, like how good can I do? No, the same way you grow up into looking like Jesus is the same way that you got into him in the first place, believing in your heart. How many of you know that you can believe something in your mind that you don't believe in your heart? Paul says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's saying, even deeper than just your mind, be renewed there. 
That's where we gotta get, and that's why we make declarations every week. That's why we meditate. That's why in worship we have those moments where there's a pause because our, our heart is open to God right then and he can minister things to the spirit of our mind. It's really what I believe. Um, so believe, then you become, but check this out. What Jesus is saying is, if you don't actively walk with me, darkness will overtake you. If you don't walk with me, walk, walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. There's no middle ground. It's not like, um, you know, you can just be a good person, but not follow me, and the darkness won't overtake you. No, it's either you are walking with Jesus or you're being overtaken by darkness. And it's freaky to think that you can be light and not be walking with Jesus and darkness can be overtaking you. <laughs> so there's no middle ground here. It's a deception and it's a lie to believe that we can coast. You cannot afford to coast. Coasting is death. Coasting will result in your destruction. It is running after God at all times with your whole heart. And sometimes running after God with your whole heart looks like this. God, it's really hard to run after you with my whole heart. <laughs> running after God with your whole heart does not mean thriving. Thank God. Running after God with your whole heart does not mean you're perfect. And it does not mean that you have arrived. Running after God with your whole heart starts in here and returning to Jesus. There's a warning for us in this because in um, Revelation, Jesus says, you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. I wish you were hot or even I wish you were cold. Have you ever wondered like, what's the deal with that? Doesn't God just, wouldn't he rather you just be lukewarm than cold? No, because being lukewarm is a greater deception than being cold. You see, if you're lukewarm, what it means is you've received Jesus, but only the part of Jesus that you want to receive. You've received the benefit without the obedience. That should make us weep. And it's the mercy of God that he spits us out when we're lukewarm because a person who is in darkness is less deceived than a person of light who is in darkness. Think about what it takes to have the Holy Spirit in you and willfully give yourself into sin and apathy. That's messed up. Like, mercy of God, fall right now, Lord, and, and thank you that you discipline us. That's the good news of all this. God judges you lukewarm, and he starts to discipline you so that you become hot. Isn't that exciting? Like, thank you, Lord, for your discipline. It's his mercy that is the reason that he disciplines us. At the end of this message, we're gonna have an altar call, okay? So just start to get your courage up now. Because if this rings true with you, I want you to come to the front at the end of the message and just be like, no more lukewarmness in my life. No more lukewarmness. I know that I've given in places to lukewarmness and I'm not gonna do it anymore, okay? I just want you to start to just, don't do that to impress anyone and don't not do it because you're scared of anyone. Do it because you're the hope of glory and the world actually needs you. But the first step is you getting out of lukewarmness. I certainly won't judge anyone that comes down. Well, actually I will, I'll be like, they're amazing. <laughs> and I'll look at the people out there and I'll be like, I know that you should still, I know that you should be up here. And no, I'm just joking, I don't think that. <laughs> John 12, 44 and 45. And Jesus cried out, I'm gonna cry out, okay? Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Jesus wasn't like, whoever believes in me, believes in him who sent me. No. Jesus was in worship like this. That is crying out. That is what Jesus was doing. He cried out and he said, if you've seen me, believe in me. Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. You see, Jesus came as light, meaning that he came as the antithesis of darkness. There was darkness pervading the earth and there was brokenness everywhere, right? Jesus came as the antithesis of that, light, pure light. But also Jesus came as light, meaning he came and revealed the Father. 
he shone light on what God was like. You didn't see God clearly through the Old Testament law. Because how could you see God clearly through a man made, uh, through a thing? You could only see God clearly by seeing Jesus. The law wasn't to um, show us all of God's heart. The law was to, the Old Testament was to preserve a people that he could send the Savior into, to that, that people. The law can't reveal God. Only God can reveal God, amen? Come on, like, what can reveal God but God? <laughs> And I just wanna ask you a question. Who here is a child of God? Who here is a partaker of the divine nature? You reveal God. Only you can reveal God to your unsaved friends and family. Only you can reveal God to your children so that they are raised in a heart for God and in righteousness. Jesus came to reveal the Father and he gives us the same mission. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Verse 46, why did he have to say this? Why did he have to... Um, Actually, verse 46 is this. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. So you're in darkness. You get brought out of the darkness. We already talked about lukewarmness. We don't wanna be light, but in darkness, right? Verse 47, this is where we get into judgment. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Let's just stay there for a second. Remember earlier that, that uh, the word judgment where it's like determining right and wrong and it's, it's like kind of saying like this is that and this is that? That wasn't, the per that wasn't Jesus' mission and his assignment. We bring up the sozo slide, Anthony? It's right after the judgment slide. This is what Jesus came to do. This is the Greek word for, one of the Greek words, the most commonly Greek you it's the most commonly, that was tongues. Who has an interpretation? Um, that was, sozo is the most commonly Greek word, used Greek word for salvation and healing. Check it out. To save, keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction. Then look at this, one, one or big I, big A, little I, okay? To save a suffering one from disease, to make well, heal, restore health. This was Jesus' assignment. This is why he came to earth. To, to save and to love and to restore. And he says right here, I did not come to judge. Guess what that means? Little Jesuses, children of God, child of God, Wilson. Guess what that means? My job is not to judge and condemn. My job is to save and to heal. That's my assignment, that's my mission. Body of Christ, our job is not to predict the president. Our job is not to whatever else, okay? Our job is to represent Jesus on earth. And I'm not trying to fire shots at prophets who predicted the president, okay? God bless them for doing their ministry faithfully, which is what I believe they're, trying, they're doing and trying to do. But our job is to represent Jesus. See, the reason he had to say, I did not come to judge the world, I'm gonna go a little bit over. Um, the reason that he said, I did not come to judge, the reason he said, I did not come to judge the world is because everyone thought he was a prophet. Some people had the revelation that he was the Christ, that he was actually the promised Messiah. But, but most people thought, oh, he's definitely at least a prophet. And what did prophets mainly do in the old covenant? Enforce the old covenant. Brought, they brought judgment upon Israel. They declared judgment when they were not fulfilling the old covenant. And they came as God's mouth. He said, you're not fulfilling this. Repent and, and go back to God and you won't get exiled. That's what the old covenant prophet would, was their purpose. And Jesus is a new covenant. Like think about John the Baptist. That's what his ministry was. Repent, you are all jacked. <laughs> Very different message than Jesus but a needed one in that time. So Jesus is saying, hey look, I'm not like the old covenant prophets. I'm bringing a new covenant, and guess what? This covenant isn't between God and humanity. Well, at least not all of humanity. This covenant is between God and the last Adam, me, Jesus, the God-man. You know, Jesus was fully man and fully human, and then on the cross, God, made a, God and Jesus were making a covenant between themselves, so that anyone who comes into Christ will be in Jesus' covenant with the Father. Who wants to be in Jesus' covenant? Yeah. 
right? Not Moses's, because he's, or Abe, you know, like, I wanna be in Jesus' covenant. So Jesus is coming to initiate a new covenant, and in this new covenant, there's, the marching orders are save, not judge. Now, this doesn't mean that judgment isn't still coming. Uh, the type of judgment we think of, where people go to hell forever, where they're deemed not righteous and, and, um, and wanting and uh, sinful at their core. That will happen when Jesus returns. The one who rejects me and does not receive my word, verse 48, has it, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. That means that on the last day, the end of the age, when I come back, I'm gonna say, hey, who all received me? Who received the gospel? That's the word he spoke. If you haven't, then I'm not even for real judging you. Like, you've had all this time to hear the gospel and to give your heart to me. That, that is when people will be judged for an eternal judgment. And man, like, dude, that should just motivate us. Like, I wanna get my evangelism on <laughs> while, it's, while I still can. You know, when you go to heaven, you can't lead anyone to Jesus. When you get to heaven, you can't be so scared and fail to give that prophetic word you're supposed to because there's no one to do that to. <laughs> Just perspective, okay? I'm like, this, this week, there was one or two times where I felt like I was supposed to witness to someone or pray, and I didn't do it. I backed off out of fear. So I'm not telling you that I'm perfect. I'm just saying, let's have perspective. In heaven, you don't get to baptize anybody. So here's the key takeaway. Jesus did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. This is what Jesus says to his disciples after he raises from the dead. As the Father sent me, even so I'm sending you. How is Jesus sent? To save, reveal the Father, so that people could be reconciled to the Father. He came to heal people and save them so that they could see, Jesus, see, see God clearly and thus be reconciled to him and see how loving and amazing he was. That's what we're sent to do too. So, I'm not gonna get practical at all. Just unapologetically, or sorry. I have a whole page, look. I could have, okay? I just want you to know I could have been practical with you, but I'm not going to. Meaning, I don't have any real application for you today, but I'll finish this later. Um, I have to, I really feel like this last verse is put the kind of the capstone. It's what I've been trying to get to. So, let's look at 1 Peter 4, 16 and 17. And if you have a tiny kid, it'd be awesome if maybe you went and got them right now um, for the chocolate worker's sake. But let it be on your conscience if you don't do that. <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe some people actually shouldn't because our chocolate workers are amazing and they want you to encounter God. And we just don't want to abuse them. Where are just over and over and over. We go over. The service goes over and it goes over and they're back there pulling their hair out. So uh, just... It's okay if you don't this time, but in general, that's what we really want to do. And maybe God's telling you to go do it right now. 1 Peter 4, 16 and 17. Do you like how I left that as clear as mud? All right. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, and you can bring your kid back in here. They won't distract me. I'm not gonna go crazy long. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. What's this saying? If you are suffering because of righteousness, if you're suffering because you're a follower of Jesus, don't be ashamed of that. And then verse 17, it's, it's, it's key that we understand that this is the context that uh, um, Peter is speaking to. He's not speaking to people who are stuck and steeped in sin and brokenness. He's talking to people who are actually suffering because of following Jesus, like totally righteous. Verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? All right, let's break this down briefly. We know that verse 16 shows us they're, they're not being judged for sin. That's not what's going on here. That's not the reason that I'm even, and, and the honest truth is that if there is judgment and if there is sin in your life, I think God will bring discipline and pruning to help you grow out of it. But in this instance, that's not even the case. And look at verse 17. It is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. What's he saying? It is time. That word time there, I'm not a Greek expert, but check this with a Greek expert, is kairos. 
And there's two Greek words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos is like your second hand moving. It's like tomorrow is Monday and the next day is Tuesday. It's just perpetually going, time is happening. That's chronos time, chronological time. Kairos time is more about prophetic moments where God is saying, this is happening now. This is a season, this is a time. Like 2020 started a Kairos moment and we're still in it. Who feel, like you know that, you see that? Um, so he's saying that there's a specific, and I, yeah, we're in one right now, basically is my point. We're in a Kairos time, just like Peter is saying they were. I believe that. Um, now here's where it gets tricky. For judgment to begin at the household of God. So basically what I think is this. These believers are supposed to look at their suffering as um, God's, God's looking at their suffering and saying, okay, I'm gonna use this suffering as discipline and pruning. This righteous suffering, I judge that this suffering is righteous, but I'm still gonna redeem it and use it. Does that make sense? The judgment is the recognition of what's going on. The pruning and the discipline is the actual pain that comes that changes you. <laughs> so how much more when the, when the church starts looking like the world, which is a sin, will God judge that that is happening and initiate pruning and discipline? I'm gonna say that again. When God sees that the church is starting to look worldly, which through this election, a lot of the church, I, started looking worldly, God says, nah. He says, no. <laughs> Judgment time, baby. <laughs> But that probably paints the wrong picture of like hellfire and brimstone because it's not like that. So when God sees the church starting to look, lose its saltiness and, and losing its light, he judges that that's happening and he initiates pruning and discipline for our good so that we can be light and salt and save people and we can bring people in because how are we gonna be effective if we've lost our taste? Are you with me? This is the judgment of God on the household of God. The Lord reproves the one he loves. In Hebrews 12, look. Um, it says this, for they disciplined us for a short time. Who? Our parents. But then it says, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. His discipline comes out of a place of, I am so good that I care enough to keep you from being you know, engulfed in your brokenness and in the sin and in the distraction. That's where the judgment is coming from so that we will become sharp again, we'll lose our um, blandness and we'll become salty, that we'll become a bright light. He's putting new batteries in us, okay? That's what the judgment of God is for on the church. So he judges and that causes him to initiate pruning and discipline. And maybe sometimes he judges and he's like, you know what, it's not time yet. I don't need to start discipline and pruning. They're gonna get this without me actually getting involved. And you know a lot of times that happens just through the world and through the pain and brokenness around us. We kind of rise to the occasion and God's like, okay, I'm not gonna initiate a test or judgment into your life or, or, a, or pruning because the world is doing the pruning for me. <laughs> but guess what? When you start to look like the world, you can't be pruned by the world. And that's why I think that God is in a season of testing and disciplining and pruning the church because there's way, and this is not condemnatory, I'm pointing the finger at myself, that I have started to look like the world. And here's where I'll end, okay? Um, a couple weeks ago, I was praying and I was worshiping and um, there was like a line in the song about like, take it all away, God, I'll give you anything. Da -da -da, and I started praying that and I just heard the word in my mind, TV. And I was like, ah, beep, no. <laughs> I love TV. <laughs> But man, the amount of TV consumption I was starting to engage in was worldly. It was not what someone, and that's, that's not like a, a rule I just place on everyone, like here's how many hours of TV you can watch before you're looking like the world. No, that it was my own personal thing that God was speaking to me about. Um, so man, like we just need to embrace, and, and there's deeper things too that I could go into about where I feel like God's been judging and pruning me, but for the sake of time and my dignity, I won't. We guys stand. I'm not saying that he will never judge the world again. He will come and do that at the end of the age. I'm not saying that he doesn't care about sin in the world and his brokenness. 
You are the solution to the world's brokenness. I'm not saying he doesn't care about sin in the church. He does, that's the whole point of my message. And I'm not saying that he causes us physical harm as a form of discipline. That's not his character, that's not what Jesus reveals about the Father, okay? Jesus healed people's sickness to, he, Jesus came and judged the sickness. He didn't come and say, yep, more sickness in Jesus' name, so they learned their lesson. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how he rolled. Um, so bring up side number 12, Anthony, please. Sorry, I had you, okay. God judges believers, aka the household of God, to prune them, which results in maturity. The outcome of God judging the world can only be condemnation because the world is not in Christ. The world is not sufficient. The world needs something, whereas we are in Christ. So when he judges us, it's because he's wanting to um, raise us up and help us and mature us. So just close your eyes. Father, we just say that we embrace your judgment. And not the old type of judgment that has been misused and misunderstood. We embrace the righteous judgment of the pruning. When you judge that we need pruning and discipline, God, we won't refuse. Just say that and say, I won't refuse. Lord, give us a sensitivity to embrace it, to recognize it. We wanna look more like your son, Jesus. Thank you that we are light. And I just pray right now, God, for conviction to fall on all of us where we are not looking like light. Lord, just with great fear and trembling, I pray this prayer. Convict us where we're not looking like light. Initiate your kind pruning discipline for our good. Now, if the Lord was just starting to speak to you and you feel it in your heart that, that he's saying, yes, I'm doing this in your life, just come down front quickly. If you feel that in your heart, like God's saying, hey, there's some things I'm putting my finger on, just come down. And Derry, will you play out the keys? I would be down here with you. Now, if you've never even said yes to Jesus, come down to the front if you want to go all in. Look, coming down here doesn't mean that you're saying, oh, I'm gonna be perfect. It means you're saying yes to what God's highlighting in your life. I'd really encourage you, if God's highlighting something in your life, there's grace, there's kindness, and there's ability right now for you to join in with it. So take courage and come down if you know that you're supposed to. Not everyone is supposed to, okay? It's not like if you're not down here, you're wrong. I just wanna say, have the boldness and the um, perspective to come down now, I'm just going to pray for you guys. I'm going to end the service, and then we're going to keep praying, okay? And different staff members are going to come and lay hands on everyone down front and, and minister to you. Um, so, Holy Spirit, just start to do your work. I bless you, Holy Spirit, to begin to do your work of pruning. I bless their bravery and boldness and courage. Now, you guys down front, keep engaging with the Lord, okay? I'm just going to end the service. So keep engaging. We want to pray with you more if you want more prayer. People on the live stream, just stand up if this is you too. And you can actually click on the link and you can go and get more prayer for this. But if you want prayer for anything else, please click on the link. Uh, we just bless you on the live stream. We bless everyone else in the room. Hope you have an amazing week. Uh, please respect the ministry time that's happening down front, okay? God bless you guys. Mm -hmm.